Yeah, I'm happy. You happy? You, you well, you should be happy. Well, you, you, you you're gonna have some more work to keep the office clean. Yeah. What? Why am I happy? Well, heck, man. Uh, look at the look at the date. It's 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 March. The capacity limits are off. I uh, I can get up to two in the office now. <laughs> yeah. You better get the place spruced up. I'm gonna have a guest soon. <laughs> All right. Hey, beautiful day downtown St. Catherine, St. Paul Street. Welcome to season three, episode nine of Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. And that would be me, and it's fabulous to be back here with you on this bodacious day. We are, as per usual, fueled by Gales Gas Bars. We are supported <laughs> by, excuse you, Kevin. We, <laughs> uh, not. A, we have no COVID symptoms on the show. Okay. <laughs> Supported by Carlo and the gang at uh, Performance Heating and Air. Uh, Mark Shirk and uh, your wonderful team at the Verge Insurance Group. Thank you very much for supporting us as well. We are heading, as per usual, into another one of our staunch supporters. Been with us all the way along through thick and thin, uh, open and closed, food and no food, drink and no drink, fiddlers, poor house here on uh, St. Paul Street. We've got a couple of uh, really interesting guests lined up for you today on the Ukrainian situation that's going on. These are people that are gonna be joining us with very, very different perspectives and their own perspectives on what's going on over there. And, and again, we invite you in to join us as you can every single week. So uh, we'll tell you right near the top of the show how you can do that because really it is your show. It's an in Niagara, by Niagara, for Niagara show. And uh, we will proceed with uh, season three and episode nine of Niagara 411 Live with Lee Starry in just about, oh, 30 seconds. Stick around. And again, uh, good afternoon. Just getting the wiring uh, adjusted here before we get underway. How you doing? Uh, this is, a, I guess, that time of year where we all wake up with our fingers crossed on a on a sunny uh, morning in early March, and you say, "Please, please let this be the uh, uh, the beginning of the end of winter, or at least the end of the beginning." of uh, spring one of the one of the two might uh, might hold true that being said it's a little nippy outside but certainly an absolutely beautiful day to be out and about in niagara kevin jack ladies and gentlemen on the right hand side of your screen our executive producer co-founder of WeStream, the technology which makes this uh, possible uh, canada's premier live streaming company Kevin, how you how you been doing? Your kids have actually been in school more than two days in a row. <laughs> I know it's so nice. A uh, little <laughs> bit of normalcy, you know. Don't have to show your Vax passport anymore to get around town. Um, you know, not sure know. if uh, if masks are soon to well, follow. Like I said, but, we can uh, now have meetings in the office down the street. The capacity limits are off. Yeah, that's uh, uh, and uh, like, who knows, fiddlers might, uh, might 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 fill up by around noon today. They're open at noon. They're open at noon, by the way. Yeah, and um, I would just uh, reiterate, Lee, like you said, the show is wide open to anybody. If you want to come on and yeah. talk about something to do with Niagara or you want to talk about uh, the atrocities that are taking place in Ukraine, and I know that's going to be kind of the focus of today's show. We've got two great guests. Yeah, I was going to mention them in a moment, but if, if you do want to comment on anything that we're talking about or bring up something that you think we should be talking about, it doesn't have to stay with the theme. Uh, just to clink, clink, click on that link. Uh, clink on the lick there at the, at the bottom <laughs> of the screen. It's just my dyslexia kicking in again. Don't worry about it. Uh, I'll get over it. Um, all kidding aside, coming up, 12.15 today, Irene Shamilo Newton will be joining us. She is the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, Niagara chapter. And you can 
obviously surmise that she has been in contact with many people from over there and uh, and Ukrainian people here in, in Niagara as well. And we're going to have an interesting conversation, I'm assuming, with uh, with Irene coming up at 12:15. And again, I can't imagine what it would be like for people to have loved ones uh, or friends in in that part of the world right now and feeling quite so helpless there's really not much you can you can do from here uh, I mean Irene of course was uh, one of the one of the or, or the big driver behind the rally that took place this past week here in St. Catharines but all we can do is show our support it, it's it's so uh, so frustrating I'm sure when uh, when you can't actually reach out and do something tangible to help. Anyway, Irene's coming up at uh, at 12:15, and also a very interesting uh, lady will be joining us uh, at about 12:40 today. Tatiana Sunak is the principal of a Canadian Ukrainian school in Kiev, and she just returned to Canada. As I understand it, Tatiana was on a two-year uh, gig, a two-year contract to be the principal of this, uh, what they call a Canadian-Ukrainian school in, uh, in, in the capital. And she had to get out after a year, and she's going to be joining us on the, on the program today. Lee, what, what you're seeing here on the screen, these are actual videos and photos that Tatiana shot as she was fleeing right. uh, Ukraine to get to Poland. And I mean, you, you've seen a lot of these on TV. I mean, just last night, I recognized that from the newsreels. That that, yep, that's that's, that's the, the that's, that's the Ukrainian uh, Poland. Polish border. And area. Uh, this is she went through this whole ordeal in the last week, fleeing to safety to come back to uh, to Mississauga. Yeah. Normally, we talk to you know people of Niagara, but well. her story I just think is so interesting. Her perspective. Of course, she knows people there. She works of alongside course. people there. She was planning to live there for another year. And um, her story is she woke up Thursday morning to her city being shelled. And that's what got her out of bed. How's that for, a, how's that for an alarm, eh? Um, this has, the thing that always gets me, and I suppose if you look back over the months, it might not seem to have escalated that quickly, but this seemed to have, uh, this seems to have gone from, oh, we're not going to invade, and Biden and the other were saying, yes, they're going to invade. No, 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 no. And then boom, hello. And uh, I don't, I, it just, I don't know what kind, you can't put a spin on this, Kevin. The world has reacted in amazing ways to pretty much do their utmost to entirely isolate the, the Russian economy and the Russian government, and that's not helping the Russian people. And I think what we're gonna wanna hear from one of some of our, our, but perhaps both of our guests as well, is their perception of how the actual Russian people are reacting to the messages that they're getting about what's happening in uh, in Ukraine. And, and my sense is that those stories, those perceptions are two very different, they're poles, uh, two very different things. They're poles apart from, uh, from what's going on. So look forward to talking to Irene and uh, Tatiana as, uh, as the show goes on. And again, glad to have you here. If you click on that link at the bottom of your screen, here's what's going to happen. You're going to automatically be popped into what we for, refer to as our Niagara 411 Live Green Room, and uh, which is the room that you're in before you go on the, on the big show. And um, Kevin will ensure that your connections are right and uh, your head's the right way around and, and all those things. And, uh, and we will welcome you on the show. And let me make this, now I sound like Richard Nixon, let me make this perfectly clear. Um, also is the fact that if there's something from a previous show, because I know we rattled the cage, poked the bear a little bit 
uh, over the last few weeks. If there is anything from the last previous shows or whatever you want to dial back in or as the uh, the political speaks call it now, circle back to, um, God, I hate that phrase, but anyway, if you want to do that, uh, always uh, feel free. The, these are your moments to do with as you please. All right, all you need is a working camera and a working microphone. It could be on your cell phone, your laptop, uh, whatever the heck it is. You don't need uh, anything particularly special to do that. Um, I want to talk about quickly, Kevin, before we go any further, um, an employee of one of our sponsors, our, our actual um, our actual top sponsor, our, our name sponsor, our go-to sponsor, Gales Gas Bars. And this popped up, it had nothing to do with us, it had nothing to do with Gales promoting its, its company, it had to do with uh, an actual customer of theirs that simply posted this because they were getting fueled at a, at a Gales Gas Bars uh, pump and uh, what they wanted to do is just send a shout out to one of their employees I think it was the one on Welland Avenue not too far from where we are right now there's uh, there it is wondering if you could give a huge shout out to the guy working at Gales gas station on Welland Avenue by Giant Tiger gas was 10 percent or 10 percent 10 cents cheaper right now than anywhere else in the city and uh, and it's a we serve station too so this uh, this fellow was actually doing the pumping of the gas etc you weren't pumping your own and uh, he said super busy but the guy is working so fast and so hard he's killing it for sure I wish I could do more for him so in this in this day and age of people talking about the fluctuation of gas prices and uh, yeah certainly it's a, it's a topic that people are talking about. In, in that day and age, we've got a, a, a fellow working at a gas station where uh, he's doing the work, he's pumping the gas, he's taking the money, he's doing everything, and the lineup is probably like crazy because at this particular place, at that particular time, it was a great deal, and uh, someone who is a customer takes the time to send a post in to Niagara 411 Facebook that, uh, Hey, this guy's doing a great job. So I just wanted to pass that along. I, uh, um, on behalf of Jessica and, and her gang at uh, Gail's Guests, they don't know I was going to do it, but I did it anyway. So anyway, um, those are the kinds of people that uh, live and work and play here in Niagara that uh, are your neighbors that do you, do you well. I thought that was kind of a neat note. I mean, how many people, you're waiting in line, you're at a gas station, you get pumped, off you go, you don't think about it again. But somebody takes the time to do that. That's, uh, yeah, uh, that's kind of neat. I think more people should go out of their way to pay respects to people when they're doing a good job. Uh, I did it this past yep. weekend. My family and I went, uh, you know, we can't go to Florida, so we went to the Americana so yeah. the kids could go on the water slide. And there was one server there that just went over and above what you needed to do. So I asked for the manager and said, no, I just want to heap praise on you. I think you should do that. When you get good service, let the have, manager have you know noticed? that somebody's doing a good job. Have you noticed when you do that... Uh, that uh, oftentimes they're so surprised. Oh, they always, always surprised. Because they never get positive feedback. When we were on our, uh, we were on our uh, vacation in the in the Dominican, we had a couple of issues with rooms at the beginning and stuff, and uh, and after after some extra effort on behalf of the hotel staff and some time went by, etc., everything worked out great for us. And I like to think that, uh, you know, kindness kills. And so, like, we're not hard to get along with people. But it was starting to get a little frustrating. And anyway, everything went fine. I came back the next day and I walked up to this fellow who was kind of an assistant manager. And he was behind the counter. And I could just see in his eyes when he saw me coming that, oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. This guy is still not happy. Uh, and he could see his day tanking, I'm sure, right, right from there. And I just went up and I said, I want to thank you for, for helping us out. Your people were great. The room is fabulous. And uh, we're super happy. And you could just see his whole body relax. Like, okay. <laughs> it's going to be an okay day. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, 
What? Sorry, Lee. Um, coming Don't be up, sorry. Coming up on the show, um, and I want to get to Irene here in just yeah. a second, but surprise today that there seems to be some new... I don't want to call it news, but information bubbling with the disappearance of Katrina Blagden. Yes. And we um, want to update that. No, and let's, also, do that tw- let's do that quickly. Are we going to do that now? No, we'll, we'll do that after because we've got Irene here. we got her? Okay. Yeah, and this is where we scheduled her, so we'll do that after. But uh, stick around for that because this is, uh, to me, uh, the biggest progress in the missing persons debate yeah. since she went missing on New Year's Eve. You'll remember, Trina, uh, as Kevin said, last she was seen was December 31st. And since then, nothing. We've had her family on the uh, on the air a couple of times, and apparently there have been new developments. So we will get to that. Joining us on the program right now, as promised, is Irene Shumilo Newton, uh, president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress Niagara chapter. And uh, Irene, I hope I got all of that right. Did I do okay? You certainly did. All Good right. Points for you. <laughs> okay. Um, now, where are you speaking to us from today? I'm at home right now, um, speaking to you through my my Zoom, obviously. Okay. Um, inundated with emails, messages, phone calls. I find it hard to leave my post here. Yes. But I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, fine. Ho- hopefully we'll be able to pass on some information or answer some questions that a lot of those emails and phone calls, et cetera, uh, are, are asking you. What What's the nature of most of these emails and phone calls that you're getting? Why are people uh, contacting? What do they want you to do? Well, most of them are for donations. Okay. People wanting to know what they can do to help. I think everybody feels helpless right now. And everyone, and I'm not speaking about the Ukrainian community, but the non-Ukrainian community, wanting to know where they can donate, what needs to be donated, where to make contact. That's part of them. I have, in the last few days, had text messages and emails and so on, asking and phone calls uh, from some young, well, not even young, I should say different ages, gentlemen who want to go and volunteer. One is to, they want to go to Ukraine. Wow. Um, and they want to know who to contact. One is a retired paramedic who wants to go and help with the situation and help the refugees in and out and even go into Ukraine and help with medical, uh, you know, um, things over there. I've had um, a retired um, military man who fought uh, in, in Afghanistan and so on. He's in his late 50s. He wants to go back. He wants to fight voluntarily with the Ukrainian army. I have a a truck driver who wants to go there and help with um, with taking supplies in to the the war zones. I'm just absolutely overwhelmed with these people and I've been trying to get contacts for them as to where they can call, uh, who to contact and how to get how to do this. Irene, this is unprecedented in in my recent and even not so recent experience. There have been conflicts occur all over the world for the past number of decades, and very, very rarely, if ever, have I seen such an outpouring of not just donations, not just uh, uh, thoughts and prayers, but also, I want to go be there. This is unprecedented in my experience. Absolutely. And I've, I've been thinking about this and mulling it over the last two weeks, like why are we hearing such unification and, and outcries from all over the world of people who are upset about all this? And the only thing I can really put together in my head is that I know with strife in, in other countries and whatever's gone on in, in Eastern, uh, uh, the Eastern Asian countries and so on, that was a lot of that was political infighting too, like right. faction against faction and, and so on, and yeah. strife in the country. This is a country that is completely innocent, has done nothing. There is no strife in the country. They've been, they've been working towards becoming a democracy, joining the West, and out of the blue, well, I mean, this has been, I shouldn't say that because Putin has been planning this for quite a while. Not the Russian people, but Putin. Yeah. Ever since he got into power, he has, like Stalin, hates Ukrainians and feels that Ukraine 
since 91 should never have been let go yeah. from the Soviet Union. Well, so, I mean, if, if you go if you go back to the to to the dismantling of the Soviet Union, uh, right. Ukraine was the jewel in the crown of the oh. Soviet Union uh, beyond beyond Russia, and of course this was this was heralded by the last uh, go round when there was the dispute uh, and the rattling of sabers, etc., over Crimea. Mm -hmm not not too long ago and yeah. uh, it's it's like this is this is the pardon the the pun this is the red line in the sand for yes. for for Putin um, what do you do do you have contacts that you're you're in connection with on a regular basis in Ukraine I do I have family over there who are uh, in the West and every time they hear or see something, and there are also contacts in Kiev uh, who send me videos and uh, and are keeping in touch and sending me um, updated posts uh, when they can is through their um, through their messaging and their email. Uh, the Ukrainian people will stand. We're a nation that has fought for its nationality and its culture for many many years over over many years, and they will not even if Ukraine falls. To the Russians or Kiev falls, the Ukrainians will not stop, and the and the society and the culture will not die, and they will rebuild, and and they've done it, you know, century after century. So we are in a be. we're in a situation right now, Irene, that seems to be like might versus right, and I don't think there are too many people that would argue with the fact that the sheer might uh, of the Russian bear, if you will, of the Russian machine. Is is significantly larger than that of Ukraine. Uh, yeah. That doesn't that doesn't in, that doesn't take a, uh, in account the heart and the resolve of the people of Ukraine. It's just sort of a, a dollars and cents and bullets to bullets kind of comparison. Where where do your people that you talk to that you're in con, uh, communication with? Where do they think this is going to end up? What do they think Putin really wants? Does he want to govern Ukraine? Does he just want to keep them out of NATO? Uh, what, what is he really after here? Yes, well, it, it has nothing to do with NATO. I mean, that's his, that's his forefront. You that's know, his that's, excuse. It's an excuse. His, his thing, and this has never been a secret, ever since Gorbachev dissolved the Soviet Union, and since uh, Putin took over, he has called Gorbachev the worst leader in Russian history for having done what he did. And Putin wants nothing more than to create another Soviet Union, but he wants to be the Tsar, he wants to be the, the leader until he dies type of thing. Like he wants to be there forever and ever. And right now, I think he's looking to try and get Ukraine back in because like you said it is the jewel in the crown for them it is the land of fertile soils and he will try to create a union with North Korea with China and with any other country that will stand with him against NATO against the rest of the free world so your sources are telling you that he wants uh, another iron curtain he wants another if not uh, bricks and mortar wall he wants another philosophical political wall that uh, Gorbachev tore down. Exactly. That's exactly right. And he'll do whatever he has to to get it. Okay. Um, what, uh, what are your people telling you now is going on? Because we see, um, I know we get, com we get complaints uh, in our country, in North America, about the so-called mainstream media skewing messages. So that's why I'm trying to ask you these questions. And what is your understanding of what is going on right now with regard to whether it's, uh, whether it's diplomatic discussions, whether it's uh, fighting, uh, whether, what, what is our status now uh, between Ukraine and Russia and the rest of the world for that matter, as you understand it? Yes, well, um, trying to have discussions with with uh, Putin and with his uh, ambassadors is pretty much useless because he'll say whatever people think that you know they want to hear from him. But that doesn't mean that it's uh, 
believable. Um, so he may say that, oh yeah, you know, we'll do a, a ceasefire, we'll do this, but that isn't going to happen. His whole premise in the beginning was to take the eastern townships that he felt he was protecting under a premise that Ukraine was being ruled by neo-Nazi governments, mm -hmm. you know, and that is the most ludicrous, the most ridiculous thing anybody could say because we all know Zelensky, you know, is a Ukrainian of Jewish origin. So how yeah. can we be the neo-Nazi country? But at the same time, he has threatened, Putin has threatened Finland and told them that if they join NATO, that they will feel the consequences, the likes of which they've never seen. And that just blows me away. That, sound, and, that, sound, that sounded like something from the Trump toolbox. Exactly. Well, I think the two are pretty closely united there. I'm sorry, yeah. but Trump has stood up for Putin already, and, and so we won't even go there. That's another story. Yeah, that's true. But, um, uh, you know, he's got his ways, and he doesn't care if his people suffer. Putin, we have no... For no fight with the Russian people. I know that they've been under disinformation for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Putin has continued to spew out the disinformation and uh, uh, an alternate history where Russia was first and Ukraine was their little brother. If you know your history, it's the complete opposite. Ukraine yes. as a nation was there before Russia ever was. Indeed. So, to listen to this is, is ludicrous. It's just ludicrous. I mean, you were um, um, the driving force behind last week's uh, rally uh, right. here on behalf of uh, Ukraine and that, that beautiful uh, building, that beautiful place of worship, that beautiful hall that is uh, always so resplendent at Niagara and the Queenie there. It was just such a wonderful, mm -hmm. um, a wonderful backdrop for all of the people. That, that showed up. And, and not just that one that's leading to my next question is, are the messages of support for Ukraine, its government, as well as its people, of course, are those messages getting through to, to Ukraine? The, the people that show up and hold the, the, the blue and yellow <laughs> flags, etc., are, is our message getting through to them? Absolutely. And I get replies back on my Facebook page, on our Ukrainian Congress Facebook page, National Congress uh, Facebook page. Our people see it. They know what's happening, and they are overwhelmingly grateful for the support. As, as one of my family said, um, they're going to stay and fight. They're not going to leave. They live, live near the western border of uh, Poland, but they are not, uh, they are not budging. And they've said, we are grateful, we are thankful for all the support, for all the donations, but in the long run, it is our country and we're fighting for it and we're not leaving. When so, someone, uh, uh, sorry, what did you say at the end there? Nothing, except that it, it just breaks my heart when I hear that. Yeah. With regard to donations, um, there is always a question anytime someone uh, donates anything, it's... Uh, how do, how do, how does this get to where we intend it to go? How are right. the how are the donations, Irene, being handled either through you through the the the, the Canadian Congress? However, how are, how are donations? <coughs> that's part one of the question. Part two of the question: How best can people donate? That's sort of a two part okay. question. Okay, so I can part one. Um, we have. Re reputable charities. One of them, of course, is the Red Cross, yeah. who have a Ukraine uh, humanitarian appeal. And we know that with them, there's another one, the Canada Ukraine Foundation, highly reputable. And there are others as well. They are flying the stuff over by cargo planes, which the Canadian government is helping with, to Poland, Warsaw, etc. From there, they're getting trucks and they are trucking the stuff over the border as far as they can get it, you know, and our only prayers are that they don't get blown apart on the way to Kiev or to, yeah. to Kiev or to Odessa or to wherever they're going, to Kharkiv, um, because it is a long trip. We're talking many hours of, of driving and that they have the fuel to get there. So, you know, everyone is doing what they can. And right now, the, the Canada-Ukraine Foundation and the Red Cross, I think, although they 
uh, probably would take tangible products, they are taking money. They would like financial donations. They can procure hospital beds, wheelchairs, hospital equipment, ultrasounds, x-rays, whatever. They can even get the people to go over there, but they need the money to help them do that. We are right now with our churches, St. John's Ukrainian Church on Lakeshore and our church on Niagara Street, mm -hmm. St. Cyril Methodius and St. George's Church on Facer Street and St. Mary's Church in Niagara Falls are taking tangible products. We're asking for dried food, uh, hygiene products. We're even asking for um, a military type thing like sur army surplus things like flak jackets, right. um, backpacks, first aid kits, um, clothing, anything. And we are packaging that and we have corporation um, that flies this stuff over there and it will go free of charge. They will pay for the, the stuff and it will fly over to Poland and again it will be trucked over. So we're all doing everything we can right now. Okay. Um, how are you doing? How are you? Up and down. Up I and down like the yo-yo. Glued to the television, glued to my computer, glued to my phone. The, it rings constantly. And uh, trying to sleep at night. I do get a couple of hours and then I wake up and then my mind starts racing. And, and then I get on the, the um, computer and try and get a hold of my family or phone them. And, and just reading, you know, finding out what the updates are because things change so rapidly. It's on and off. But my, you know, it's, it's gut wrenching. My, my heart is up and down like the yo-yo and, uh, You're okay. and I have a good husband, a good husband who supports me. <laughs> good. I was going to ask, I was going to ask you that. You're okay though. You've got a support system and, and, uh, uh, and you're okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're, we're all dealing with it in our, in our own way. Yeah. Okay. Um, those of us, uh, as I said before, we can't, I mean, I know this sounds weak, but we can't imagine, uh, I, I guess about the closest we could come to imagining um, what we experience perhaps is some of our, some of our relatives living in areas where there are uh, bad fires or something like that and their lives are in danger. But this kind of insurrection, this sort of, this, this sort of um, military, uh, al almost early 1900s style uh, initiative is something that we have never had to live with uh, beyond a certain age and uh, it's well, I can't imagine it I can give you one response to that my mother and my father escaped from Ukraine in 1941 when the war broke out the second world war and the Germans were coming from the west and the Russians were coming from the east and they were right in that area near the Polish border in Lviv. And they managed to get out and, uh, and, and made it to Germany, worked as many in, in work camps. And then eventually after the war got to England and then I was born in England and then we came to Canada. So my mother passed away two years ago and I can only imagine how she'd feel. But my mother's very good friend is still alive. And I spoke with her the other day. She can't stop crying. And she said to me, I, this, she said, I remember the war. I remember being in Ukraine as, as a young teenager. And she said, I'm reliving it. I'm reliving the whole scenario right now. And it's, it's breaking my heart, she said. And I just can't stop crying. It's horrible. And I, you know, and then it gets me going. And, I, and so, yeah, we've been lucky. We've lived in a nice, quiet bubble. Yep. our whole lives and now it's hitting us like a like a world war three breakout you know I, I don't know what what to say i just hope that nobody decides to put their finger on a button and try to blow up the world i don't know where else to end it but there irene thank you very much um, thank you for the opportunity yeah and speak. please please stay in touch with us uh come and join us again next week or uh, any week uh, bring us updates uh we're yeah. we're here to be your mouthpiece for niagara because i know everybody in niagara is interested in what you have to say and uh, maybe we can even cut down a, a bit on your email and the phone activity if we can answer the questions for you here but uh oh. thank you so much uh um again um, our, our, our thoughts are with you and your family and uh, all of your friends that have this uh, common cause ahead of us. And uh, I think you have more friends 
and I think you're finding this out, you've got more friends inside and outside the Ukrainian community than, uh, than you may have even realized. So um, I, think, I think you're right. God's, God's strength. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. God bless. Wow, Kevin, that was pretty uh, powerful conversation. And uh, Lee, I mean, going back to back here, I'm anticipating Tatiana Sunak is going to join us in about five minutes. Yeah. And you want to talk about a perspective. Um, this is a GTA area woman. She's a teacher. She was on a two and a half year contract in the Ukraine, living in Kiev, and just had to flee. As we've seen many news reports kind of detail, we'll hear yeah. it firsthand what's that, what that's like yep. and what she's hearing from people not just in Ukraine, but a very interesting perspective on uh, Russian media. Well, and, we are, and Irene alluded to that as well. Yes, yeah. Well, we are talking about this. There are those people on the planet who are celebrating, and I want to just give a shout out. Sorry about the sound of the zipper. Can I, can you, I don't know, can you see this? Not really, but you can read it. Let's say Bourbon Street. Yeah. See the trumpet? Yeah, Bourbon Street. Bourbon New Street. Orleans. And it says New Orleans. That's, that's, that's my, uh, you're going to hear this on the, <laughs> um, uh, salute to uh, those celebrating Mardi Gras in uh, one of my favorite cities uh, in the world, uh, New Orleans, uh, Fat Tuesday was, uh, or as we grew up calling it, Pancake Tuesday, happened, uh, happened this past Tuesday. Unfortunately, my Fat Tuesdays have turned into Fat Wednesdays, Fat Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, to those celebrating in uh, the Crescent City of uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, wish we were there again, but uh, while all of this strife is happening, there are some people parading and partying, and uh, we have to let them have their parties, because uh, that's part of what makes life go around as well. Um, um, Lee, yeah. I, I had mentioned that we we're going to give the Trina Blagden update. Yes. Um, let's hold off on that, because yes, we've got okay. a little bit of momentum here. Uh, Tatiana's waiting in the green room, so all maybe we can transition to that. But want to let people know there is a bit of an update from um, that Kelly Blinded, Trina's sister, posted this morning. Yes. And I want to share that with people because it's, it's, to me it's the most significant news that we've heard in two months. I was going to say, this is the first time we've actually heard anything that might be construed as new with regard to the disappearance of Trina Blagden, and we will be talking about that uh, before the end of the program. And as Kevin said, we've, uh, we've got the theme rolling and let us roll into Tatiana Sunak. Uh, Tatiana um, is the principal of a Canadian-Ukrainian school in Kyiv who has uh, just recently returned to Canada. She joins us now. She returned uh, uh, before her scheduled return uh, for obvious reasons. Tatiana, hi, how you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm well. Not as good, not as good as Ukrainian people, but yeah. I'm happy to be in Canada, that's for sure. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have mixed emotions about that too, don't you? Of course I do. Uh, we just did a um, call out for our teachers. We are still missing. We cannot locate 36 teachers out of 118. We have no idea where they are, if they're alive or not. Uh, they do not respond. Um, again, we haven't started calling out our students yet, so we don't know where our students either. But um, it's, it's hard. I was um, trying to be there as long as I could. That's why I left after uh, Russia started bombing U uh, Kiev. And I it's it's hard it's it's hard to see like i'm looking at the images and what's happening to kiev the most beautiful one of the most beautiful cities it all is. the cities in europe it's uh, it's devastating it's, it's tatiana can it's, you can can you roll us back in time a little bit to give us your background as to what took you um back to um, Ukraine and the position that you were hired for, etc. Sort of paint us the picture, if you will, of um, what your life was supposed to be like. 
So I left, uh, I immigrated from uh, Ukraine in 93. Since then, I was in Canada. I worked uh, for last 20, since 99, worked as a teacher, then administrator for Toronto District School Board. I also was uh, very um, heavily involved with Ukrainian community. I always, Ukraine was always part of me. And uh, last year I was uh, offered a job at, um, at this private school. Uh, the reason why they needed, uh, because the school offers Ukrainian Canadian diploma for students, mm -hmm. they needed Canadian administrator. So that's why they offered me a job. Uh, my contract was for two and a half years. So I arrived last January. So it's been, um, so I was there for a year. And um, and now I am here back in Canada. And uh, it's it's uh, I can tell you that I haven't been in Ukraine for twenty well almost thirty years, and the change that I thought it was mind blowing. Uh, and I even thought about moving permanently to Ukraine really? because there's so much potential there. Uh, there is so much, um, there is so much growth and, um, and people are so different and uh, I really loved it and it breaks my heart even more because Ukraine that I left was different. The Ukraine that I saw these days, this year is completely different. How, how, how are they different? How did you see the people as different and how are they different now? They are more free, they are more educated, almost everybody speaks English, even little kids. Uh, they are, they care about their country. And this is something that I, I haven't seen before. Even the people who are business people, they really want their country to be successful. Not, their, not the personally them, but uh, students and their country. And this is not what, uh, that's something that I haven't seen when I was there in 90s. What uh, happened that, I know what happened, but I'm trying to think of the chronology of, of how it happened. You said you were supposed to be there in a two and a half year contract. You were there for about a, a year and now you're back here. Were you ordered to come back? Did they close the school? How, how, did, that, how did that happen? Well, we, when they, sorry, when they, okay. when they start bombing, yeah. uh, then I decided that I have to get out. I know that Ukrainian, uh, the Canadian, Canadian consulate was, uh, was, uh, warning us and was asking all Canadians to leave mm -hmm. but I didn't believe that it's actually going to happen and um, that's why I waited until last minute we had number of Canadian teachers who left earlier okay. and um, and you know what and they did a good uh, they made a good choice I did not because I again I was there for my students for my teachers I knew that they needed me uh, they needed that additional support, and um, but again, when I heard first explosions, I knew that I have to get out because my family here was going nuts. They were going crazy, and if I did not leave, then probably I don't know. They they probably my mom probably would have end up in the hospital, and my daughter as well. So, so you had uh, you had your mom here. And was your daughter here in Canada while you were in uh, Ukraine? Yes. yes. Oh, oh my gosh. So was your was your was her grandma looking after her, her nana? Well, my daughter, my daughter is grown up. Oh, she's she grown now. She already okay. has. Yes. All right. She so already has her own kids. So. Okay. Okay. So that's a, that's a that's a good thing. But that's still still different. What did it What did it feel like when you had to step on that plane and and leave? Well, I didn't make it because airports were closed. So 
I had to I had to find a ride to west part of Ukraine from oh. Kiev. Oh my! And then uh, and so luckily my best friend's uh, student was driving from Kiev to west part of Ukraine, so they picked me up. They drove me all the way to the west part, and then one of our relatives took me to the border as far as he could. And then I had to walk 23 kilometers to the border to get to the border. And then that's the border with Poland, correct? With Poland, right? Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, and then I had to wait another. So it was um, another 18, 19 hours in line. Not even you cannot even call it line. It was a crowd <sighs> that was trying to squeeze through the gates to get through the border. Yeah. Uh, and that took another 19 hours to get to the Polish side. Um, Tatiana, one of the things that um, Kevin mentioned earlier that you have a fairly clear view of is the difference of how the media over there, uh, and by over there I mean in the two places, I mean in Russia as well as in Ukraine, are covering this event and as I understand it there are two very different points of view is that correct well I watched them um, again I because I do have access to Russian TV and I watched a lot what they post in a uh, YouTube and everywhere else in, in the media a lot of Russian people don't see anything wrong with that. They think that uh, Russia has to do it because they have to protect their own borders. They think that Russia, Russian army is actually freeing Ukrainian people from the nationalists that took over the country, and which is completely falsified. And. Um, it's it's completely wrong and they don't see that because the media is so controlled there they don't see all the killing they don't see all the damages that are caused they don't see the Kiev being destroyed Kharkiv being mm -hmm. destroyed all the big cities are being destroyed they don't see that because the media is very much uh, filtered and they only see what they need to see. So, so let me go back a little bit just to clarify, to, to repeat so that you can tell me if I'm wrong or right. The, the Russian people, as far as their media is, is informing them, believe that Ukraine is under threat from internal forces and Russia is, is liberating them. Something like that, yes. Okay, so what sort of, uh, has, has Russia taken control or attempted to take control of Ukraine media outlets as well? Well, I know that they've blown uh, the TV, TV tower in Kiev, uh, so they destroyed that already, so they're definitely going for the media, and they trying probably trying to take it over. Um, I know that in again a lot of, in a lot of cities that this I was talking to one of my VPs. Uh, she's sitting in the house. She doesn't have hydro for last uh, two 24 hours, and um, so I know that a lot of people are going to be cut from the media and they won't have any access to to information. What do you see as the next, as they say, shoe to drop? You still have uh, teachers that work with you. Are, the, uh, do you. are there still teachers that worked with you in Ukraine? Yes. Well, again, I still, I still, right now everybody is on a March break because Okay. There was no, there was no reason, like there was no way to continue with the school. Okay. Um, we hope that we will start online teaching in two weeks or in after March 14th. Okay. But again, it depends what's going to happen. I hope that this war going to stop. I hope that the, like, I hope that I know that there is, um, 
discussion today between Zelensky and uh, Putin, and I hope that they're going to come up with some kind of compromise how to stop it, because there is no reason why so many innocent people have to die, why the country has to be destroyed. It's it, it, it doesn't make any sense. We are from the same ancestors, and this is what hurts the most. Uh, we all came from the Kiev Rus, like we all were part of the same country that again later split into Ukraine and Russia. Like our, m most of the families have both Ukrainian and Russian blood. They're so interconnected, it's like killing your own brother or sister. I don't understand that. I, I really cannot comprehend it. I cannot, it just does not even fit into my mind like it, it there is no explanation there is no logical explanation or logical reasoning for anything almost it almost feels like a civil war of, of some uh, of some sense and i guess i guess if you dig down deeper because of just the kind of history uh, and political and social history and genetic history that you were talking about um, people like uh, Putin it would be it would be like ripping out his roots or something like that if uh, if Ukraine were to um, be more aligned with the West than with the mm -hmm. East so this, it's a it's a big deal for him but to go about it this way is is amazing. What ages were the, uh, Tatiana, what ages were the children that you and your teachers were, were instructing? Well, we had from kindergarten all the way to grade 11. So from, wow. from smallest to the oldest. How, how many in your school? 545. 545. What, did, did your school get damaged? Was there any, any, any arm fire on, the, on it? Uh, not yet, because it's in the middle of the city, so they did not get to that part yet. Okay. And there is, um, again, we are, uh, I guess at this point, that area has not been damaged yet. All right, now, who... Do, who and do I you, hope that it's going to stay this way. Uh, I agree. Who do you actually work for? Who, who is your employer as a, as a principal of a school like that? Uh, so the school is owned by Osvitoria, and um, so it's a it's an organization that uh, works with teachers, educates teachers, and it's a privately owned company. Oh, okay. Uh, so the the one of the owners is Zoya Litvin. And, and where are um, they? Where are they based? Uh, Kiev. And uh, actually, okay. yeah, and actually Zoya's husband is there right now and he is fighting with everybody else. Wow. I know that, I know that she left um, as soon as again, she, she was there until last minute, but she has a little one year old. Yeah. So she had to save her kids. So she left with kids, but uh, her husband is there and he's fighting with everybody else. Will you go back? It's a very difficult question because uh, both my mom and my daughter, when they saw me, they said they're not going to ever, ever, ever let me go again. Mm. And uh, I don't, I don't blame them. They had, you know what, for me, I was running, I was escaping. I didn't feel as much pain as they did. And uh, for them, sitting here and waiting and not knowing where I am and if I am safe or if I'm coming back home alive, that's probably, it's, it's very difficult. So yeah. I don't know. I cannot, a, I, cannot, I cannot answer that question at this point. How do, your, how do your countrymen and women feel about your leader, Mr. Zelensky? How do they feel? Um, I, I have a lot of respect to him, especially right now when he is there with his soldiers and he is fighting uh, for his country. I know that a lot of people have a different 
feelings or opinions about him because he does not have any political background and um, he doesn't he doesn't have enough knowledge but I think in the last year he grown a lot as a leader and he's probably I I'm sure that he's gonna be a good example for other leaders this is how true leaders supposed to be they're supposed to be with their people they're supposed to be for their people and and they should not be hiding from their people or running away if there is a danger tatiana um i want to thank you very much for for being with us today i can't uh, none of us can really imagine the the stress and the emotional roller coaster that you have been on for the last uh, number of months in particular. And I, I would ask uh, only one thing of you, and that is if you would uh, uh, agree to be with us again and to sort of serve as our local correspondent, if you will, uh, as to how things are going in your world as it relates to that world that is changing by the second uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, and around the Black Sea and, and, and that Crimea and Russian area. Just if you could, if you could uh, agree to stay in touch with us or let us reach out to you, that would be, uh, that would be awesome for us. Yeah, I'll be happy to provide you any information that I have. And, and I hope, like I really pray that, you know what, the like miracle gonna happen and this war gonna stop because Hardworking people in Ukraine do not deserve that. No, they don't. And they are really, they are really good people. They are very hardworking people. And you probably know a lot of Ukrainians. There's a lot of them in Canada, and they're all good people. Like they're not. There's not. No, we believe. It's not you. because they're my people, but because they are. Uh, go hug your family for us, okay? And uh, we'll talk to you soon. I hope. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so Kevin, um, as <laughs> we were, Kevin and I were just sort of um, yapping before the show about uh, how different experiences are for different people, and there have been all sorts of memes through social media and everything else, and uh, you know, it's a so you think you so you, so so you think you got it bad. Fill in the blanks. Yeah, my my heart absolutely broke last night seeing images of young children holding out in subways. Yeah. In Kiev, just for safety and running out of water, running out of power, running out of food, running out of electricity. And I heard uh, one little girl talking about her even smaller, younger sister saying, well, I, I feel sorry for her because she has to go underground uh, because it's not safe enough to go home and, sh and she's afraid. And this is a little girl talking about another little girl. <laughs> it's like, we're going back to the war all over again. My, my mother-in-law lived in London, England during the Blitz. She remembers the doodle bugs going over in, in the 40s. And she said, as long as you heard them, you were okay. It's when they were coming over and they stopped making a noise that you were in trouble because they dropped. And like, can you imagine anything like that? And this, this, is, this is ringing of those kinds of experience and it's 2022 i mean the worst the worst we experience lee is all, in all honesty in our our little enclave on ontario is like a windy day that's as bad as it gets for us like to be perfectly honest is what a tree fell over lost some power lines this is real i, I mean out I west we have, yeah, i mean out west we have our we have our extremes we have our forest fires it said but this this is a this is a man versus mother nature this is not a this is not a man or a human versus human conflict out of the it's like maybe maybe poor analogy to drop it's interesting though i mean you know the 
the world is so connected now through technology where you could see that biases of generations ago, ago saying, and I mean, um, uh, uh, Tatiana made a great point of it, as did Irene, that we all know Ukrainian people. They're fantastic. They're just like <laughs> you and I. Whereas people are people 40, are people are people. 40, Polish 50, people 60 are years great. Ago, Ukrainian people are we're great. All great. Hungarian people are terrific. Every, they, they, and these I, are good people. I don't know that 70, 80 years ago we really knew that. The world wasn't no. as connected. But no. now we've seen people from all over the world. We've interacted with them all. They're all nice. Like what the... Chinese people are good people. Japanese people are good Everybody's people. Good. German people are good people. The people are the people are the people. It's the... No, he's not a nice person? Putin. Huh? Putin. He's not a nice person. No, he's not a nice person, but he's not a people. He's a Putin. Right, but because of that, we don't say Russians are bad. Of course and like, not. And like uh, Tatiana, that was great insight to say, you know, she reads the Russian news. She one sees the, what they're getting. One of the things I wanted to ask her, uh, and I forgot, but uh, was the fact that we have seen, uh, seen of, well, they're supposed to be. We don't, it's really hard to know what to believe you see anymore, but... At least we have seen scenes that they say they are actual Russian citizens in Russia protesting this war, this, this invasion. How real are they? I don't know. What I was wondering is how did, how did that information disseminate there? I mean, I know there's always underground, so maybe that's why. How did, the, how did that uh, information disseminate so that they realize that their country's actually doing something wrong. You know what, Lee? Um, Tatiana's hanging out here, so let's just, let's ask her. Hi, you're still there? I'm still here. Yeah, good. I can leave. Okay, good. Let me ask you this question. When we were talking about uh, the misinformation that uh, the Russian people were receiving from their own government-controlled media, and what we see here in the West are demonstrations or protests from the Russian people in their own cities uh, they protesting the war or protesting the invasion of Ukraine. Are those, are those shots real? Uh, and if so, how are they getting their information? If you understand what I'm asking. Yes, I do. And I think that they're real because I also seen those. I seen Russian people protesting and I also seen what their police was doing to them, okay. like dragging them and hitting them. Um, I know that, um, Starting, I believe, a couple days ago, they're yeah. not allowed to protest at all. Even if uh, if they want to protest, again, I don't know, this is the information that I just yeah, yeah, heard, yeah, yeah. that they can only, stay, if you protest and you're protest, you can protest by yourself. You cannot protest with a group. In a so group. it's only one, oh, okay. one man protest. Oh, yeah. But... Um, Again, like if, if you listen to even to the uh, media, U.S. Canadian media, and when they talk to those to Russian people, they are afraid. And uh, I know that there is a lot of political prisoners there. Anybody who has any other opinion is thrown in prison, and it's not it's not fun there. So I don't blame <laughs> I don't blame um regular people because they right. are afraid of course uh, that that uh, uh, the, the the only reason the only reason I giggle is because it, it's not fun there and I, I'm sure that's an understatement anyway thanks for popping back in here and asking that question yeah. uh, Tatiana have yourself a great yeah. weekend all right thank you so there we go uh, we'll just uh, put a bow on it for now Kevin and uh, and wait for updates. Fascinating show, fascinating conversations. It, um, I did not foresee anything like this happening again in our lifetime. I remember the Cuban crisis in 1961, uh, whatever, yeah, it was 62. Um, I remember it like it was, and I was just a kid, but I remember it. I remember listening to the radio uh, Kennedy waiting for, for, for Khrushchev to, to back down. I remember the 80s with Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Uh, and, 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 and he did. And then, as we heard today, Putin thinks that uh, Gorbachev 
w the, the worst possible leader of all time because he figures he should have kept up that wall uh, and, and proceeded as the powerful Soviet Union. But Gorbachev saw what was going on. He knew the world of public opinion was turning against him. He knew that, uh, that tides were changing and was trying to bring Russia into, uh, into the, well, I guess 19th century, um, even though it was the 20th. But, um, Kevin, the politics of this are fascinating, the history is fascinating, but the heartfelt, the hurt comes from the personal experience that, that has to go along with it. It's not just politics and history. These are people that never expected to have to live through these kinds of things in their lives. I mean, they, they, you, you talked about um, uh, the media and the, and the reality of the case. Um, you are actually yourself, other than being a historian and uh, knowing what happened, is the Vietnam War was the very first conflict that was carried out in real time, in prime time, and the world was uh, entertained and, and, and aggrieved and horrified all at the same time on a daily basis by what was happening today. The Vietnam War brought war into your living room. And, and now it's there in 10 seconds, 24 hours a day. And uh, maybe that's a good thing because we can stay in touch with what's happening. We can be outraged 24 hours a day instead of just sound bites uh, on the 11 o'clock news. Yeah, and just to, uh, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, Lee, absolutely, to put a bow on it. Um, if, if I think a lot of us feel the way that Irene expressed, that we don't know what to do, we don't know how to help. Um, the Ukrainian Canadian yeah. Congress, Niagara Chapter, you can find them on Facebook, and uh, they know the proper channels with which you can help, lend support. I mean, real interesting for her to say that she's hearing from people right here in Niagara that want to go to Ukraine and physically be boots on the ground and, and help in whatever way they can. And, and that's astounding because there isn't a, there's, all, there's been Estonia, there's been like, pick a, pick a conflict um, other than the wackos that might have gone over to marry some sort of crackpot ISIS fighter. Uh, that's a whole different yeah. sack of hammers. But as far as people wanting to be emotionally driven to go fight for a cause, I don't remember the last time this no, I've happened. Never seen anything like this. And, and honestly, Lee, uh, for my generation, World War II, you may as well call that the last world war. We didn't grow up in a world it's like Game thinking, of Thrones. We don't. thinking that there would ever be a world war. And here nope. we are on the precipice because if any other nation retaliates with force outside of Ukraine, I think the toothpaste is out of the tube. Yeah, well, again, look, another poor analogy. This no, it's not. This is a watershed moment for not only Europe. This is a this is a watershed moment for our our planet. And Let's see, I, could go. We're all way. very interested. Um, Lee, we got to move on to some Niagara things we've been promising. I woke up today to probably um, the most encouraging news that I've heard about the disappearance of Katrina Blagden. We've all been aching for this young lady, and we know there are other missing people, but this is a story that has just captured the imaginations of all of us here in Niagara and beyond. Uh, uh, of course, uh, a Canadian Forces veteran. She disappeared, or at least we assume she disappeared, uh, early on December the 31st. In the in the Martindale Fourth Street area of uh, of St. Catharines, was not seen again. Um, her her Jeep, her beloved green Jeep, was left behind. There were many many searches that took place for her of to no avail. But this post appeared from Trina's sister Kelly, whom we talked to on this program a few weeks ago. Kelly says, we have been made aware of some new information that is very credible. With that being said, the most I can tell you is that we need a certain area plastered with posters ASAP. The area is below the intersection of 3rd Street Louth and 3rd Avenue Louth. 
we would like to start there and work outward. If you feel this is something you can help with and don't have posters, then please reach out to Bonnie Lights. Our parents will make sure the posters are delivered to you. As always, thank you for your continued support. We couldn't do this without you guys. Now, uh, 3rd Avenue and 3rd Street Louth is sort of um, north, uh, south, south, east west of, of the, the hospital. St. Catherine, correct? Like it's up that way. But sort of, uh, sort of a, it, it's more of a country fied agricultural area. There are some houses up there, but they're very, they're, they're sparse. They're separated a, a fair there, bit. There yeah, that's, that's, I mean, if you just head west from Great View, right? Great View Public, public yeah. School in that area. Yeah. There's that, there's that church right there. And if you take that over the 406, that's your 3rd Avenue and 3rd Street right there. Okay, now we can ask all kinds of questions. Like, what, what information, uh, I'm assuming the information might have come from the NRPS. I do not know. I'm just saying, where would they get this information from? But they're not obviously willing to, to part with that. Um, why? I, 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 I don't know. I, too many questions. I, I know they've probably searched that area, but I don't know how well they searched that area. I don't know what the purpose of plastering it with posters will do, because Kevin, wouldn't you believe that by now people in that area are sure uh, and, and well aware of Trina's disappearance and who this young lady is? All, all we can do, Lee, is try and read between the lines. And, and just help them out. And if you read between the lines here is her sister saying... Um, that being said, the most I can tell you is that we need a certain area plastered with posters ASAP, and that area is exactly that, the area of well, then I'm assuming 3rd Avenue and 3rd Street. So Then I'm assuming they're going to plaster it with searchers. I, I would think now... I, I mean, I would think that would be more important than posters, is to, just to plaster now, Lee, it with if you, people. If you look at the, lap, uh, the map here, it's, it's fairly close to her last known sighting, which yes. is at the Firehouse Subs out on 4th Avenue. And out on 4th Ave, you're getting close to, like, the Princess Auto area. Right. So, Firehouse, there it is right there, Firehouse yeah. Subs. Which is fairly populated. I mean, it's not, it, it's not out in the boondocks. No, but it doesn't take you long to drive, a, drive across 4th, right? You get, there's, and there's 3rd Street right there. Yeah. You jog up 3rd Street, and you come to 3rd Avenue. Yep. Yeah. I'll, uh, I would wager that the detectives working on this case are really working on this case. Ripping their hair out over this. Because it's one of those, it's, 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 it's like one of those shows that uh, show up on 2020 or Dateline or, or something is, how did this? How did this happen? What are the circumstances? Where did it go? How does it end? And um, and she's got such a dedicated family. She has children in the Ottawa area, and um, I, I assume that the, the kid's father is, is still involved with trying to keep them uh, keep them looked after. And yeah, the, her sister and her mom, and like this, this is a whole family <laughs> effort. And the, this is a military family too. This is. Uh, I mean, Trina's a, a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. Served in Afghanistan. Yeah. It's no, no joke. I mean, um, if people do have, um, you know, if, if they have a particular interest, I would encourage them to join this Facebook group, the Missing Katrina Blagden Facebook group, because right. a lot of the information and new information is being posted there. Mm. So I would encourage you to do that. Meanwhile, uh, Lee, on Niagara 411, there was an update on another missing girl, and people are starting to put together, and again, I don't. I don't need to go into the history of our community, but people are starting to ask questions as to what's with Hi, all the missing females. What is females with all the missing people? In, in Niagara, particularly females and young female. Now, um, this girl here, uh, Stacy. Yep. Hamilton girl, but was known to also spend some time in Niagara. They really, the Hamilton cops uh, released new info about uh, 33 year old Stacy. 
possibly seen walking on Highway 20 in Wellingport yesterday. That's not a good place to walk. Uh, I don't know. It's a day ago. Highway 20 Wellingport. I mean, that's way out west, right? That's, yeah. I mean, you're in yeah. you're in the middle of nowhere yeah. at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we did try and get in contact with uh, with Stacy's family to see if maybe they could add mm-hmm. more information to it. Um, you know, they're, they're being pulled in so many different directions right now. We're just trying to find some answers. Sure, yeah. Uh, but they do indicate that maybe maybe there's a history of a mental illness in the family. So possibly this isn't as um, as bad as it could possibly be. If you know what I mean? She, she may have just left of her own accord, and, and hopefully she's found safe. Every story that, has I, two sides and then the truth. And I don't know if so. the... Um, you know, I don't know at this point in the Katrina Blagden search that we're we're holding out hope at this point that that we find Katrina alive. To, uh, to completely shift gears, one of the things that uh, I wanted to mention to warn you about, in case you had not seen it, and uh, Kevin, it always amazes me that it doesn't matter what is happening in our world, there is going to be somebody that is going to try to find a black market buck behind the initiative and this is the scam that developed overnight after our premier announced that they would be eliminating fees for license stickers in Ontario and not only that but refunding what you have already spent on your license stickers Um, come Come March. Well, here we go. Service Ontario. As you know, we have removed license plate stickers on all vehicles. So we are giving you back $120 Canadian. Get hold of it here. And there's a link. And it's bogus. (laughs) That That is bogus. You do not have to. Just to clarify, uh... If you are eligible to receive a refund for your license plate sticker fees, you do not have to apply for it. It will just automatically come to you. All right? Your government is just automatically going to give you money back. Now, yes, we know there's an election coming up, so you can make your own conclusions. But the fact is, you do not have to apply for anything, so if you see something like that, it's a scam. It ain't happening. It ain't real. Now, Lee, not everybody in our community is on the wrong side of the law. There's a lot of good Samaritans out there. I know Nick likes sharing those stories. And people wanted to thank uh, Aaron, who is giving a hand. They always say the Louth Street Canadian Tire. I think everybody calls it the 4th Ave. 4th Ave, yeah. The 4th Ave Canadian Tire. And here's here's a story that Nick shared. We got more Louths in Niagara than you can. Nobody knows what a Louth is. What is a Louth, anyway? Anyway, uh, yesterday afternoon, that's just me spouting. Uh, Yesterday afternoon. Uh, my 86-year-old papa took quite a tumble right on his face. Ooh, outside of the Canadian Tire in St. Catharines, an amazing lady named Aaron stopped to help him up to his feet, make sure he was okay, and clean him off. Our family would like to extend our gratitude to Aaron for her kindness towards our loved one, and my papa would like to extend his thanks for the comfort in a scary situation. We need lots more Aarons in this world right now. My pop is, excuse me, my pop is doing well. Uh, some bruising around the eyes, but his spirits are great. Thank you. Uh, nice story. And every time I see Papa, it makes me uh, grin because that's what my grandsons call me. You papa, a Papa? I'm a Papa. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I got a Mamer and a Papair on the French side. A Mamer and a Papair, right? Yep. And then I got a Grandma and Grandpa on the, uh, the Anglo side. Awesome. How's we stream doing these days, Kev? Uh, WeStream is doing great. I would just encourage anybody, if you need help with a, with a seminar or a conference, if you need to bring in a hybrid element, if you need to live stream, if you're looking to reach a, a larger audience, if you want to capture your event, that's one thing that surprises me, Lee. If you think about the advantages of live streaming, the amount of effort that goes into putting on a conference or a seminar, mm. just by adding on the expense of bringing WeStream on board, not only do we help you reach a larger audience, but you also then have a takeaway. You own the footage of your event. So it doesn't just poof into yeah, thin air. Yeah, you can air. do it again. Yeah, it just doesn't go away into, into, into thin air. You now have a recording of the event that you put, put on. You could use that to sell it to more sponsors uh, forward or down the road. You could use it to promote yourself. There's a bit of a legacy from your event. And without that, again, once your event's done, it just vanishes into thin air. So another yeah. reason to bring WeStream on board. Um, how you doing, Lee? 
I am doing uh, really, really well. I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing well. Uh, the the voicing business is uh, is is pretty good. I get an in, I get a chance to read some interesting books, uh, and I like to read books anyway. Um, but every now and then, the interesting books come around, and they pay me to do it, and it's kind of neat. So that's one of the things that Lee Sterry Voice Services does, and uh, it's uh, it's enjoyable. But more uh, more even than that is is the fact that after. Oh gosh, I think a 48 or 49 year uh, career in media at all levels, from, from on air at all night shows and dinky little stations uh, out west to uh, major market morning shows and then to executive positions with some of the cursed mainstream media companies uh, on the planet. Uh, what I'm enjoying most after all these years right now is actually being a part of this sort of new genre of, of communication that, that we're doing and kudos to you for sort of having the kernel of this idea and, um, and, and, and at this late, late stage of a career it's, uh, I'm re-energized of uh, getting in touch with people in different ways and doing different things and, and providing different uh, values like uh, Gail's Gas Bars who fuel this program uh, as our title sponsor, Performance Heating and Air, uh, Carlo and the Gang, uh, and uh, Virgin Insurance, Mark Shirk, and, and the group there, and of course we stream for putting this whole thing on. These are these are energizing, in spite of the fact that we have to talk about some pretty um, depressing, dark things. Um, this is this is a new age of communication that. As I've said before, anything can be used for good or evil. And we know there are a lot of people that use the communication abilities out there right now and, the, and, and those things for evil. I feel this is something that we're doing f uh, for good for Niagara. And I'm jazzed to be a part of it. I really am. Cool. Uh, me too, Leah. I'm super excited because we get to talk to people like Tatiana, talk to people like oh. Irene, or talk to anybody in Niagara that wants to come on the show. We also get to share up and coming music yeah niagara musicians all right so today uh it's a it's a bit of a heavy band i don't know if you want to call it you know whether there's death metal hard metal 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 i don't uh, even know if we have those designations so much anymore. some of these subgenres, but uh where anger lies and they got a video for mm. shut your mouth these guys are from stevensville stevensville uh, it's heavy but it's good it's heavy, but it's good music. So we're going to play that coming up. And uh, Lee, we also have a couple of videos to get to as well. I know uh, the, a guy took a drone over the empty Welland Canal. Oh, did you, did you have finish. that? Good. I want to get to that and also want to get to the, um, the polar bear dip. Yeah. But one thing we didn't touch on, and maybe we'll leave it at this before we get to kind of video time, is the, uh, the serial puncher down in Fort Erie. Yeah. I mean, this is just, this one is kind of actually, bizarre. Actually, this used to be a thing. Uh, a few years ago. This was happening in New York, LA, uh, major streets in major cities, Chicago, etc. And somebody would just walk bes walk up beside somebody and, uh, and hit him in the face. It was almost like it was a dare. It was some sort of trendy thing that was going on. Well, apparently, uh, the punchers are back. Detectives from 5 District Fort Erie are currently investigating three random assaults that have occurred in the area of Queen and Goderich uh, in, in Fort Erie. Within the month of February, three separate incidents occurred. Adult males walking alone at night, targeted. In each incident, the suspect stru uh, snuck up on the victim and without provocation, punched him and ran away. None of them uh, suffered serious injuries, but I'm sure it didn't feel good. Uh, and they're, of course, uh, always re uh, requesting any information. But I don't know why this thing is coming back, but remember when this was a thing a few years ago, Kevin? It was like you'd walk by somebody and, uh, well, not you, but uh, a person would walk by somebody and just plow them in the face for no reason. This person is apparently between 20 and 40 years old. <laughs> that's kind of tough to narrow down. Yeah, pretty wide range, but that's it. I mean, a serial puncher. Serial puncher. It's like, are you trying to join a gang and it's your rite of passage? What is that? <laughs> and then the, and the Well and Canal thing I thought was cool. Now, this is actually a 15-minute video that a fellow did and Nick posted it. Hi Nick, by the way, at Niagara 411 and all your contributors and Nick's mom, 
uh, sorry we didn't get to you sooner. Uh, always a pleasure to partner with you guys on uh, on content sharing, etc. Here at Niagara 411 Live, and this fellow d did this long video of uh, the the wintry well and canal, and of course they always empty it. What I always find interesting, uh, and and they didn't announce it this year, is like how many cars and trucks or wheelbarrows or guns or what what do they find in there that's what that's what's always more interesting to me is what I wonder what they found in the canal this year the other thing that gets me is wouldn't you expect we've got these big ocean liners that are passing side by side in a place like what you're looking at right now and it's not that deep look how shallow that I mean I know it's not full of water but say you take the water right up to the banks it's still not, it still doesn't look that deep. That always amazes me when I see that. Well, I think that too, every time I go through one of the tunnels. I'm really yeah. not going down that far. No. And so how much space is there between me and that big ship no, that's don't, upstairs? Don't. don't hit the bridge, don't hit the bridge. Yeah. Oh, and oftentimes they did hit the, hit the bridge. I know a guy that used to be an operator in one of those little those little buildings that's on top of the lift bridges. I often wondered what that would be like to have that job. And, like, that's a job you don't want to screw up, isn't it? <laughs> Think about, like, you, ask you the, make... Uh, ask you, the poor Robinson guy that fell asleep. Exactly. You make a mistake at work, okay, well, a camera goes out for a little while. I make a mistake at work, I just have to take my foot out of my mouth. That guy makes a mistake at work, uh-oh. <laughs> Pretty neat stuff. And this is this is in our area. Now, Phil Gladman, I believe we are looking at. Uh, yeah, Phil was with somebody, and so you'll see. Yeah, you'll you'll see be some, somebody else will come into the frame. And this was the, the, the polar bear uh, jump for charity. Josh, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for Now, this is also on the, is this, is this on the canal or the, or Henley? Where is it? It's, it's on the canal, and Phil makes reference to the fact that he's used to going in cool. and um, for float Why fest down around there. So I'm assuming it's at the Lincoln Docks, which, by the way, just got rebranded by the city of Welland. They're going to refer to it simply as the Docks. They have like a, they have a little cool. building there now, made uh, made from shipping containers, and you'll be able to rent. Um, I don't know whether it's canoes, kayaks, what it is, but but more of a home there than they've ever had. Okay. Isn't he a little overdressed? Aren't you a little overdressed, though, Phil? Oh, there's and Phil. Yeah, I think he's... There's Phil there. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you're about to see more of Phil, Phil than you ever, so you ever want. Oh, okay, so he's going to get a little less dressed? The cause there, there's Phil the getting undressed. Said, okay. If we added an additional, uh, and I just want to pull up exactly what it's for that, and who uh, these people are, Lee. Okay, maybe this is more and, uh, than you want to see. I think that's so Joshua Walsh with Thank Open so Arms Phil Mission of Wellness. Okay. And for the successful coldest night of the year fundraiser. Okay. I'm starting to get a little first. uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm not going to get down bare bones. <laughs> Phil is going full force. Woo! Oh my. Oh, you can't do a polar bear jump with socks on, Phil, can you? Oh, that that's not sick. Oh, gee. Riding a little high there, Lee. Oh, gee. See, I knew this was going to a bad place. Oh, Superman underwear? But if you want to be sexy, you got to take your socks off. Yeah, this is Woo! <laughs> oh, Phil, your life will never be the same. Here we go. Well, what's the other dude doing? He's standing there like head to toe in clothes here. Either way, I'm not going in. I give him full credit. I don't care oh, what me you're too. Wearing. Yeah, if you go oh, in. Oh, me too. I'm not criticizing anyone. In fact, oh, I'd, so I'd, he dips his toe in. Like, how cold is it? I'd much rather go in and then have the warm clothes oh, just to jump. put on when I get back out. Just jump. <laughs> Come on, Phil. There you go. Uh, oh. Well, Phil, thanks so God bless you. Nice. All right. <laughs> Woo! And a plate. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh my. 
such civic pride, but no personal pride whatsoever. <laughs> 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 no, well done, guys. Uh, I love you, Phil. All right. And, and well, I'm sorry, Kevin. Who's the other gentleman again? Oh, gosh. Joshua. Joshua. Thanks, Josh. I'm part of uh, Open Arms Mission and Coldest Night of the Year and all that. And uh, coming up music wise, the song's called Shut Your Mouth by Where Anger Lies. It's, uh, it's heavy, it's loud, but it's cool. Thank you, Irene uh, Shimolo Newton, Tatiana Sunak. Uh, we will talk to you both uh, again. Impactful show. Kevin Jack, as always, a uh, masterful job. It's a pleasure to work with you. And ladies and gentlemen, have yourself a wonderful weekend as we hopefully inch our way towards spring. Gales, performance heating and air, Verge Insurance. Thanks. I'm Lee Sterry. Cheers.